Well, it's been nearly a month since Election Day, but the mainstream media is still melting down over the reality of a President Trump. Why is this not government intervening in the private sector? I know the glass is half empty tendency of many in the media. Well, but it's not about the what media, you saw sir. Here, what you saw happen you, here. The media, hitting the media is always a crutch for you guys. It's a, it is not about the it's media. Not a, it's not there a crutch. Seven. The way Donald Trump lies has people rethinking some of the basic premises of journalism, like uh, the assumption that everything a president says is automatically news. I think Trump does it differently than past presidents. His lies are different and deserve scrutiny. Never in a million years could I have imagined myself on this stage in New York really appealing for the safety and the freedom of the American press. And I base that on, obviously, Donald Trump's rhetoric against the press. I feel I have to stand up for my own tribe uh, in the United States. The president-elect took to Twitter to hit back at the media. If the, he says, quote, if the press would cover me accurately and honorably, I would have far, I have far less reason to tweet. Sadly, I don't know if that will ever happen. Now, Chuck Todd, Brian Stelter, and Christiane Ovenpour, three journalists with decades of quality reporting under their belts, somehow allowing the idea of a Trump presidency to throw even these veteran journalists off their game. I'd say Trump is living rent-free in the mainstream media's head, and I love it. Greg, we start with you on this. Um, these people wouldn't normally be saying some of the things they're saying. Well, you know, it is the pendulum swing. You know, we, you know, remember President Obama lived in our heads for eight years. He's so still now, there. So he's still there. So now Trump is. <laughs> but the great thing is. The point you're making and the point we're all making is media, the media is really the yellow cab and Twitter is Trump's Uber. He's found a different way to get from point A to point B without their help or interference. And you know when, when um, uh, what's the young fella from CNN, Stelter, he says the like, young fella. He says Trump's deceptions are different. He said lies. Not lies. He said lies. lies. lies are different. Okay. No, the conduit is di the conduit, the way they're delivered is different. President Trump trafficked in a lot of lies and a lot of bad ideas. But the transportation model was the New York Times, the New Yorker, NBC, NBC mainstream media. Remember, these are the lies. Now, these lies weren't on Twitter. These lies were in mainstream media. Uh, women make 77 cents on the do dollar. Fracking is, is harmful. Police shootings are up. Uh, global warming is killing polar bears. Uh, Cuba gives great health care. Michael Brown is an innocent person. These were all falsehoods perpetuated in mainstream media. So you can say that Donald Trump uh, perpetuates deceptions. They're, they're nowhere near as, as big and as so, widespread. So not only that, the... Um Yellow cab media is the yellow cab yeah. for President Obama. If they won't pick you up, what do you have to do? You got to yeah. call an Uber. You got to call an Uber. You got to call an Uber. Uber. Yeah, say so two times rate. Just pay it. Yeah, yes. it delivers. Um, look, you know, obviously they're upset. They called it wrong. They got it wrong. They're getting a lot of backlash about this. And he found a way to go around them. He's like, I don't need to go and play by your rules. I'm going to take it directly to the people, take my case to the American public, and see if they feel ready for this movement and what I'm talking about. And the answer was, Resoundingly, yes, they were. And you saw that across the country in the number of counties that he won, the number of people that came out to his rallies and to support him. And still, for some reason, the media needs like a little safe space to handle it. And that's, uh, you know, it's disappointing. You got to put on like your big boy pants, cover the news. It's true. Or I'm whatever. Wearing mine. You can't fit in those. <laughs> mine <but> shorts. <laughs> Yours are like mini shorts, but dolphin shorts. <laughs> whatever it takes, whatever fits you, and deal and cover the news responsibly and accurately and like grow up about it, right? They had a honeymoon with Obama now, the rest of us. You can ride the shorts and ride the shorts. Juan, can I, can yeah. I ask you to t make some, take some, bring some clarity to Chuck Dot, a veteran journalist, a friend of mine as well. And he just, it Not anymore like, now. Well, no, but, but why did he change it into, hey, you know, you're using, the, you're, you're taking a shot at us as a crutch when he was asking Mike Pence a very serious question. I, I just, I'm not sure why these veteran journalists are off their game. Are they that angry that there's a Trump presidency? No, it, look, I, I think they're disappointed. If you want to know, I think most of them are liberals, if that's your point. But what you've got here, going back to Friday when Trump came out, right? Trump goes after the press. Despicable. These people are liars. They're right back there. We've got them in a pen, and then the crowd hoots and hollers. And he calls them out by name. And he talks about, oh, an anchor crying at the election. You know, so he's playing a game with the press. The troubling part of it is, you know, if you look at PolitiFact, it's like 70% of his claims not true. And people say, well, it doesn't matter. It's Donald Trump. It's symbolic what he just said. Don't take him literally. 
But if you're in the press, your job is to hold powerful people accountable. You're supposed to call them out every time. You're not supposed to be their buddy. But Trump only wants buddies. He only wants people who confirm. But can I just respond food. to that real quick? And then, uh, okay, so you're talking about there are small things. Uh, believe me, I called Trump on a lot of them on you things. That I, I, but but the media let President Obama and most liberals get away with the big yeah. themed ideas, the ideas mm -hmm. that are that over time bankrupt the country. Yeah, the, and Lisa, and we'll just take that. So the media is supposed to hold the the office of presidency accountable. We haven't really seen that over the last eight years. Oh. Well, look, the media. Juan is right. The media's job is to hold First candidates of all, never and politicians. Never started a line with Juan. <laughs> the only right. time in history. Uh, <laughs> or literally, you're gonna get a little moment. shock collar. Oh uh, boy, oh yeah, boy. I don't, I don't want to inflate, you know, but. <laughs> But no, the media's job is to hold people accountable. But who's holding the media accountable? And that's the big problem. The press has been able to run amok, and nobody has held them accountable. And as someone who's worked for Republican candidates, uh, for Republican members of Congress, the bias is real. And Juan even pointed that, that out, the fact that the majority of the media is liberal, and the scrutiny that is given to Republican candidates, Republican politicians, Republicans and member, members of Congress is a lot more amplified than it is to the Democratic Party. So the thing I like about Donald Trump is the fact that he he is not dealing with any of that. He has held them accountable and he's essentially rendered them useless because he was able to figure out a way, Uber or, you know, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Um, he's been able to find a way to bypass them and to get his message out. He did that with Twitter. He did that with his town halls. He did that with his Facebook lives. And I think that is a good thing because it's time for Republicans to stand up to the media and to stop taking it. Well, listen how they exactly did that over the weekend as a bevy of media royalty freaked out about being called out by the president-elect via Twitter. Some politicos defended president-elect Trump's use of social media to communicate with Americans. He's communicating with people in this country who felt like they've not been listened to. He's going to be an unconventional president. Who cares what he tweeted, you know, on some Thursday night if we fix this country's big problems? That's just the way I look at this. President-elect looks at his social media accounts, a combined 25 million or probably more at this point, users on Twitter and Facebook as a very good platform through which to convey his messages. Um, I can tell you firsthand that there are posts that he makes that otherwise would not be heard or seen by those 25 million people but for him posting them. I think one of the reasons people get so concerned about the tweets is it's sort of a way around the press. The modern era, modern technology, he's the point where we don't need you guys anymore. Yeah, and, and well, maybe that is part of the reason that these liberal left-leaning media are so up in arms is that he is able to make, take one tweet, copy it to Facebook uh, and, and Instagram, and reach 30 million people. He that's is not, going around the press. Well, no, first of all, president of the United States, I don't care who it is, has a, you know, famously known as the bully pulpit. If you can make a statement, you can stand up, you can shout, the president can say anything, and then it reaches the American people. The question here, Eric, is what happens, you know, let's, let's imagine that Trump goes off the rails and becomes a demagogue. And the demagogue then has a populist base that says no matter what he does, we love him. He can say whatever he wants to say. He's going around those terrible people in the mainstream press. Well, exactly then, who is it that will say the king, this? the emperor, has this? no clothes on? This? Pre President Obama, Barack Obama, not the POTUS account, has about 17 million, but Barack Obama himself has 30 million Twitter followers alone. Sure. So any president can go off the rails and become a demagogue. Why is this? Wait a second. To I don't think, I, I think you don't like Obama, but I don't think you would say <laughs> Obama became a no, demagogue. My, no, point, no, my point is you're, you're using a hypothetical. What if Trump goes off well, the rails? Well, he does go yeah, off the rails. Yeah, but Obama went he off the rails? Things, what, what he is says things that apples aren't apples? true. Well, no, but, uh, but Juan, he ha he's not president yet. And you're already going like, what if, believe me, there's enough mainstream media around to go after Trump and mm -hmm. it will happen. The honeymoon will be over and there will be people there. There's, a, a, there's another side to this. Though. The reason, Twitter is, is, is a great way for him to communicate with America. But he's got to take some responsibility with that because okay. that means you don't retweet or get involved in any kind of conspiracy thinking because we would see, like, we know this. Around the table, we get people tweeting at us yeah. saying, why aren't you covering this story about Pizzagate? We know it's false. Oh, we I'm know glad, it's I'm false. glad you brought that no, up but that, my point this is, weekend. No, but that's my point, is this, my point is this. With something great, a great tool like Uber, you got to make sure the drivers are safe. Right. So you got to have some responsibility. But I also think there's a danger with the media because they sensate Sensationalize everything with Donald Trump. So the problem is when you, when it is the media's job to hold presidents accountable. To hold, so, but when you over sensationalize everything, 
then when do voters or, and, and, and people and Americans actually know when there's a problem? And the Democratic Party does this, too, because when you call everyone a racist, when everyone is a bigot, when everyone is sexist, then who actually is a bigot? Who actually is sexist? The problem is when you over-sensationalize everything, when, when that is your, your MO, when that is your game, then you muddy the waters. And well, I, see, think I think it's hard to make hard, things Lisa. clear when you do that. I apologize. Okay. Okay. Just let me just take a second here. But I just find it hard to say it's the media's fault for over-sensationalizing, Lisa, when he says things about, you know, people being rapists and thieves, when he says things about John McCain is not a hero because he got caught, when he says horrible how things How about when left Barack Obama says you didn't build that? Or what? how about when Barack Obama you didn't or the, when the There's Democrats an argument. Say, you don't Hillary like Clinton the argument, but it's did not... drop the ball in Benghazi. Did, Ma go ahead. Madam, Pre President Obama has enjoyed really like a fairy tale romance with the mainstream media. They are very much, they like him personally. They like his politics, his ideology. So to say anything, I mean, he's the one that really hasn't had a full fact-checking and whatnot. He's actually had, I think, quite a nice relationship, a nice eight years with the press, with the exception of him calling out and having a problem, you know, with the Fox News channel, because we're actually reporting all of the news instead of just select, you know, positive stories. You've got to talk about actually what's going on everywhere. Now, the flip side of it is nobody's had it so bad as President-elect Donald Trump in terms of the amount of like bashing, trashing in the press, even the New York Times saying, you know, that they got it wrong, that they went too far, that they need to do a better job of having fair and balanced reporting and covering accurately. So the, I think this is going to be uh, a know, real a test of, like, for Mitt journalism Romney, in this country. His fellow country Republicans said this guy's not telling the truth. Fellow Republicans. Future Secretary of State. Yeah, the yeah, guy who ended Romney. up the Never Trump movement, and you're calling a fellow Republican. But he's going to be Secretary of State. That's all going to be. I'm going to say he's not. <laughs> But we're going to talk about that coming up. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel joins us live from Washington with more on that. Mike. John, good morning. House Speaker Paul Ryan says lawmakers and the new administration must bring relief as fast as possible to people who are struggling under Obamacare and signal that will be the first priority. The Speaker says it will be patient-centered health care that gets everybody access to affordable coverage so consumers can buy what they want. Ryan says lawmakers are still working on the length of the transition period from Obamacare to a new replacement system so people don't lose coverage. And he says health care won't be one size fits all. It depends on the age of a person. So uh, we, we believe that we should uh, have support based on age. The sicker and the older you get, the more support you ought to get. Um, if you're a person that has um, low income, you probably should have more assistance than a person with high income, for example. Ryan and President-elect Donald Trump got off to a very bumpy start during the 2016 campaign. Ryan says they are fine now. They speak regularly and decided right after the election to let bygones be bygones. The speaker says their focus now is moving forward on fixing major issues in this country. He's going to be an unconventional president. I really think we have a great opportunity in front of us to fix problems, produce results, and improve people's lives. Are we addressing the concerns of people who are tired of being tired? And who cares what he tweeted, you know, on some Thursday night, if we fix this country's big problems? That's just the way I look at this. Ryan says he thought the odds were clearly in Hillary Clinton's favor in the 2016 election and says he was pleasantly surprised on election night. John? Some candid stuff from the speaker in that interview. Indeed. Mike Emanuel. Mike, thank you. We've seen the president-elect engaging the world. He's spoken to more than 50 world leaders. I've, I've spoken to several dozen myself. And uh, he received a courtesy call from the democratically elected president of Taiwan. Well, it was prearranged. To congratulate him. And, well, it was, they reached out to offer congratulations as leaders around the world have. And, uh, and, and uh, he, he, uh, he took the call, uh, accepted her congratulations and, uh, and good wishes. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was precisely Did that. He... I understand uh, some of the controversy in the media about this. But I, I think Not just the media. It's with the Chinese that... government. Well, yes, of course. But I, I, I would tell you that uh, I think, I think the American people have, find it very refreshing, the energy uh, that our president-elect is bringing to this whole transition. That's Vice President-elect Mike Pence reacting to criticism of the president-elect Trump for taking a congratulatory phone, uh, phone call from the president of Taiwan. Are the media overreacting? Joining us now, Cheryl Atkinson, host of Full Measure and author of the upcoming book, The Smear, How Shady Political Operatives Control What You See, What You Think, and How You Vote. Also with us, Rich Lowry, Fox News contributor and editor of the National Review. Cheryl, to you first. Do you think the media are overreacting? If so, why? I'm not sure it's an overreaction. Is more more than 
unfair coverage tilted to one direction. I think, of course, if President-elect Trump has deviated from diplomacy or practice for decades, it deserves critical coverage. But that doesn't mean every bit of coverage by media outlets should be critical. It means also you're looking at the other side, and I think the media fails to realize in some instances that uh, there is another viewpoint, that there are people who would view very positively the idea that Donald Trump would come into office with a different approach. There are a lot of people who think things have not been going well the past uh, several years or even decades in many areas, and they would like to see something fresh, but you don't see that viewpoint represented, except to the extent when Trump supporters are represented sometimes in the media, it's to call them all as a group alt-white or racist or alt-right, alt-white, supremacist or racist. Yeah, the the president-elect is just out with a tweet about, well, we presume it's about all of this. Here's what he just sent out. He says, if the press would cover me accurately and honorably, I would have far less reason to tweet. Sadly, I don't know if that will ever happen. Is there a double standard at work? He seems to say there is, Rich. Yeah, well, the coverage was extremely hostile in the run-up to the election. And then after the shocking result in the election, you actually had some soul-searching in the media. The New York Times wrote a letter to its readers basically saying, sorry, guys, that we blew this because we weren't giving both sides. And now all the media has really um, snapped back to the way it's always been. Every other day, there's some hysterical story where Donald Trump has supposedly created some crisis that's going to blow up the world or blow up his administration. So Cheryl is right that this is an important story. It deserves coverage, but everyone needs to take a deep breath and not uh, uh, put it on the headlines as though it's a, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis again. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl, you, you make a, a parallel or a comparison between what the Obama administration has done with Iran. Well, I would just say that compare the coverage that President-elect Trump got for accepting a phone call or taking a phone call with Taiwan to President Obama making secret deals with the largest state sponsor of terrorism on the planet. And I would argue that the media outlets that have covered one critically have not covered the other with the same level of criticism, although arguably at least as important, if not vastly more important. The uh, Wall Street Journal is out with an editorial which notes this. It says it's notable that China has reacted better than the U.S. media to Mr. Trump's phone conversation. Beijing protested, but its foreign minister d dismissed it as a petty trick by Ms. Tsai. Uh, Beijing censored the news inside China, while the English language China Daily suggested Mr. Trump simply made a mistake. I wonder if people at home think this is just all a little silly. The man accepted a phone call from the Demo democratically elected leader of Taiwan. Uh, yeah, Rich, I, think, I think that's right. But the, the median voter sitting at home thinks, why don't you accept the call from another democratic, a democratically elected leader? And you know, China's reaction, at least so far, has been fairly muted. And I think you're going to see that from a lot of foreign actors around the world. They're going to give um, President-elect Donald Trump and President Don Donald Trump in a couple months a lot of latitude because they want to see ultimately where he's going to go and two, just as importantly, I think they're all a little bit afraid of him. Interesting. Well, let, let me go into the idea that perhaps this wasn't, I don't know one way or the other, but an uncalculated misstep by President-elect Trump, but what if he's crazy like a fox and that he intended to send a message? There are, again, viewpoints out there that are valid viewpoints to consider that think the United States doesn't have to, in every instance, please China or do things the way that has been done in the past. There are people who think things should be shaken up. And I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying those viewpoints deserve some coverage in addition to the critical coverage. Yeah, the Washington Post has a story today actually saying this was weeks in the making. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons the coverage is so critical, everyone assumed it was a mistake. And some of the things that Trump folks had, had said, including Mike Pence um, yesterday, seemed to suggest they didn't consider it a big deal and it just was a congratula congratul congratulations call, but it seems to have been more than that. All right. Uh, we're going to keep watching this story and, and the media reaction to the new Trump administration. It's pretty fascinating to watch. Cheryl Atkinson, Rich Lowry, thank you both. Tonight we begin our 15-part series on the first 100 days of the Donald Trump administration. This evening, a look at Obamacare and Trump's promise to repeal and replace it. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy said today a repeal vote will occur, quote, very soon in the new Congress. Correspondent Rich Edson looks at the massive challenges ahead for the reformers and the consumers. 
And what's your name, Matt? Chris Schweppe runs an internet marketing business from his home in Northern Virginia. He, his wife Gina, and children Sawyer and Scarlett have Obamacare insurance. They bought a mid level silver plan on healthcare.gov and receive a subsidy. They say some of the related costs are too high and the system has been inefficient. My biggest thing is it just comes down to cost. Um, my, you know, when, when it comes to business and family, I don't really care about politics. The tax credit is not compensating for the increase of the premiums going up, so the tax credit is really not helping us out in terms of lowering the cost. And their health insurance may soon change, dramatically. Republicans now control the future of American health care. Since Congress passed Obamacare, they have run on repealing it. Congressional leaders say they will secure an Obamacare repeal, possibly within the Trump administration's first 100 days. Hey, look, we need to get Obamacare relief to families as fast as possible. Republicans have written several health proposals of varying levels of detail. One of the more thorough versions, a plan from President-elect Donald Trump's selection to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. Georgia Congressman Dr. Tom Price. His plan unravels Obamacare, its mandates, insurance rules, and subsidy program. Instead of shopping for insurance at healthcare.gov on the Obamacare exchanges, the Schweppes, under Price's plan, would receive a tax subsidy based Based on their age. Price also helped write a plan released by House Republican leadership. It features a similar system of age-based tax credits. As Republicans move to replace Obamacare, they must decide whether or how to prevent millions from losing that insurance while they draft its replacement. Republicans in the Congress are not going to vote to take health insurance away from 20 million people. So no matter how much they talk about abolishing Obamacare, they're going to need a replacement. They would still need to agree on how to pay for these insurance credits, whether to keep or repeal Obamacare's taxes and spending cuts, how much to give states to insure their sickest patients, and whether to maintain or scrap all Obamacare insurance reforms. It's going to be hard to get to the finish line, settle on a single plan. They're going to have to decide what kind of subsidies they want in the individual market or for small businesses. They're going to have to decide what do they want for the equivalent of the, the Cadillac tax or do they want to not have anything like that at all? What will be the insurance rules and how do you handle pre-existing conditions? The administration says Obamacare has covered about 20 million people. It features popular provisions like a allowing young adults to stay on their parents' insurance plans until age 26. It prohibits insurance companies from denying coverage and charging more money for previous illnesses. Days after Donald Trump won the presidential election, the Wall Street Journal spoke to him and reported, quote, he favors keeping the prohibition against insurers denying coverage because of a patient's existing conditions and a provision that allows parents to provide years of additional coverage for children on their insurance policies. Of those, he told the paper, quote, I like those very much. It's a lengthy list of questions whose answers will have substantial consequences for American families and small businesses. Bottom line, I mean, small businesses are run by people that have families. Mm -hmm. And when you have a lower cost of business, you're going to be more likely to hire people. When I see my costs going up, and then I'm thinking that in six months from now, my costs are going to be going up even further, it makes me a little scared to hire somebody to help me out. And uncertainty about whether a Republican plan will be better than what they have now. To pass major legislation, a bill usually needs at least 60 votes in the Senate. Republicans are several votes shy of that threshold, though, thanks to a Senate budget procedure, Republicans could repeal and replace Obamacare with 51 votes in the Senate and a simple majority in the House. The same procedure Democrats used in 2009 to pass much of Obamacare. Brett? Rich, thank you. Part one of 15. Tomorrow, Shannon Bream will take a look at President-elect Trump's expected Supreme Court nomination or possibly nominations. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Donald Trump is not waiting until he takes the oath of office or even until he hires a secretary of state to start shaking things up on the foreign policy scene. As the list of candidates for the top diplomatic job grows, the president-elect is already aggravating the leaders of the world's most populous nation, a nation he relentlessly criticized during the campaign and continued to do so on Twitter over the weekend. Correspondent Peter Ducey is outside Trump Tower again tonight with the latest from the next leader of the free world, sending a pointed message to China and looking for just the right person at Foggy Bottom. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Brett. Today, the president-elect got a visit from a one-time Democratic presidential nominee who won the popular vote but lost the election. And it may not be the one you think. 
Former Vice President Al Gore came to Trump Tower today for a sit down about climate change with Ivanka Trump and possibly more. The bulk of the time was with uh, President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, I, I found it an, an extremely interesting conversation uh, and uh, to be continued, and I'm just going to leave it at that. When the former VP walked out, the next Secretary of State again became the big topic of conversation. As we've learned, the businessman president may want a businessman representing him abroad. There are a number of people that we may not have thought wanted to leave in a very lucrative private industry position to go and serve the government, and they are coming forth now and expressing interest. ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson is now in the mix as a possible Secretary of State, and so is former Ambassador to China John Huntsman, a rival of another famous Republican from Utah, Mitt Romney. In October, Huntsman said Mr. Trump should withdraw from the race, telling the Salt Lake Tribune, quote, the time has come for Governor Pence to lead the ticket. But two months later, his tone has changed. You know, I'm, I'm greatly honored that my name is even in, in a mix. Others apparently being considered for Secretary of State, Democratic U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. The senator says he'll be here in the next few days after talking with the president-elect last week, and Republican Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, who says he's being vetted and who agrees with Mr. Trump about teaming up with Moscow to fight terrorism. Russia uh, uh, and the people of Russia are good people, and they have a chance to work with them to defeat this, uh, this evil that threatens the planet right now. The transition team today finally announced that Dr. Ben Carson had accepted an offer to serve as Housing and Urban Development Secretary. Mr. Trump says, quote, he is a tough competitor and never gives up. The incoming president is also now promising to stay active on social media because he says, quote, if the press would cover me accurately and honorably, I would have far less reason to tweet. Sadly, I don't know if that will ever happen. Over the weekend, Mr. Trump used a six-tweet burst to warn American companies that anything built in a new New factory abroad is going to have a 35% tax slapped on it when sold in the states. And the transition kept moving forward inside Trump Tower Monday, while outside, the former Green Party candidate Jill Stein held a press conference about the recount efforts she is trying to organize in three states, where she revealed she's not trying to take the election away from Mr. Trump. And I think it would be unfair to raise expectations that the outcome is going to change. That's not our intent. The president-elect is really picking up the pace of his thank you victory tour this week with a stop tomorrow in North Carolina, then Thursday in Iowa, and Friday in Michigan. So he'll be trying to fill up arenas while trying to fill out his cabinet simultaneously. Brett? Peter Ducey, live outside Trump Tower. Peter, thank you. We're learning more tonight about the circumstances that preceded President-elect Trump's protocol-shattering phone conversation with Taiwan's president. National security correspondent Jennifer Griffin reports from the Pentagon. It turns out the call was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. For the first time, China sent two bombers capable of launching nuclear weapons to circle Taiwan. Fox News has learned the November 26 foray was a test for U.S. allies in the Pacific. Japan scrambled eight fighter jets to intercept China's H-6 bombers. President-elect Donald Trump's controversial call with the president of Taiwan incensed Chinese leaders. General Jim Jones, President Obama's first national security advisor, offered his perspective. That didn't bother me. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the purists are, you know, flapping their wings and, you know, saying all kinds of things. Why they can't have a five-minute conversation or whatever it was to say congratulations is, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But So I don't, I didn't, it didn't bother me. A view echoed by one of Trump's possible picks for Secretary of State. Nobody in Beijing gets to dictate who we talk to. Since the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s, China and Taiwan have been separately ruled. China claims sovereignty over the island. Trump is the first president or president-elect to speak with a Taiwanese leader since the U.S. broke off relations in 1979 under President Jimmy Carter when his administration established formal relations with Beijing, marking the start of the One China policy. Trump's chief of staff pushed back on suggestions the president-elect made a mistake. He knew exactly what was happening, but look, we've got a lot of problems to solve in this country, and we're not going to solve them by just, you know, making believe that people don't exist. Trump's response to his critics came in a tweet. 
Interesting how the U.S. sells Taiwan billions of dollars of military equipment, but I should not accept a congratulatory call. U.S. arms sales to Taiwan have totaled more than $46 billion since 1990. In December 2015, the United States announced a $1.83 billion arms sales agreement to Taiwan, the first in four years. The White House was on the defensive today. It's already spoken twice to the Chinese. Senior officials of the National Security Council have been in touch with their Chinese counterparts to uh, reiterate uh, our country's continued commitment to a one China policy. Another point of friction, trade tariffs. China imposes a 25 percent tariff on imported cars, while the U.S. charges two and a half percent or less, giving China a huge advantage, Brett. Jennifer Griffin, live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you.